that I want to say good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning to all of our students in our schools. Uh, thank you so much for making time for this event this morning. On behalf of the United Way of Greater Greensboro, I want to welcome you to today's interactive student meet and greet featuring Reverend Naomi Tutu. I am Kari Garvin, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president and CEO of the United Way of Greater Greensboro, and we are excited to host this event. Thank you for joining us or for watching today's recorded video. We truly hope that you will find Reverend Tutu's remarks inspirational and encouraging. Now, as people, we should all be working together to create a better future for ourselves and for the next generation. And as school students, you represent that next generation. Today, Reverend Tutu will challenge you to continue finding out more about what makes, the same, makes us the same as people versus what makes us different. The future depends on all of us working together for the greater good. And today you will discover that you have the power to do great things. In just a few moments, Reverend Tutu will speak and then give a few of you the opportunity to ask questions. So I hope that you all really will do that. We are so excited to hear and learn from you as well. But before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about Reverend Tutu. Reverend Tutu is a child of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nomalitso Leah Tutu. Her father is known around the world for promoting human rights and was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. She was born in South Africa and has lived in many communities and countries around the world, which influenced her passion to advocate for the well being of others. Inspired by her father's legacy, Reverend Tutu found her own path to make a difference in the lives of others and has become a world renowned human rights activist. It really is a big deal that she's with us here in this moment. She was also inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. And today we'll offer her insights on how we can continue learning from his peaceful teachings. Prepare to be motivated and inspired students as she discusses the topic, our shared humanity, creating understanding through the principles of Martin Luther King. Please join me in welcoming to the screen, Reverend Naomi Tutu. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kyrie. Good morning. Good morning, students. Um, I can see Andrews High School. Thank you, Coach S, for telling us what school you are. And welcome to students in Bridget Wiley's class and um, all, all of you who are here. It is, it is really great to be able to join you this morning. It is really early where I am. I am in California and it is only just seven o'clock here. So if I stumble over my words, it's because I still haven't had my first cup of coffee. So have some, some patience and grace with me this morning. It is, it is, it is indeed a pleasure to be with you. And I, I hope I will inspire you, but I want you to know that for me, much of the inspiration that I have to do the work that I continue to do comes from the opportunities of being around young people who tell me that they see the world in ways that encourage them, that challenge them, that give them hope even as they get angry very often at the ways in which we as adults are, are handling the world. And I, I like to share the stories that have impacted me um, and have made me want to work for a more just world in the hope that some of those stories will, make, will connect with something in your life, in your experience, and will encourage you to, to believe that you can make a difference uh, wherever you are. And, and so, you know, when we talk about Martin Luther King Jr., I think that most of us 
uh, because mostly because of the way that we have seen him portrayed in the media, that for most of us, the stories that we know about Dr. King are around the I Have a Dream speech, the March on Washington, maybe the march in Memphis that, um, that ended in his death. Um, his, his work around bringing an end to the Vietnam War. But I have always been inspired by the stories that happen a little bit in the background, the stories that we don't see on newsreels, that we get to hear about from people who were around him. Because I think that, that when we talk about leaders in our world, that it is, it is what they do um, often when the cameras are not on them that are actually the places that teach us the most. And so my favorite story about Dr. King, um, which is to me is central to his teachings is about him with his brother-in-law driving from one speaking engagement to another. And so Dr. King had given, an uh, given a, a speaking engagement and his brother-in-law was then driving him to the next engagement. They were, it was at night. And I know most of you probably are not driving yet. Uh, maybe you are, um, but that you probably know that when you drive at night that the common courtesy is if you are driving along a road and you have your bright lights on to see more clearly, that if you see a car coming from the opposite direction, you dim those bright lights because your brights blind the driver of the other car. And as they were driving, um, drivers coming from the opposite direction consistently were not dimming their bright lights. And exasperated as most of us would be, his brother-in-law said, well, the next time this happens, I'm not going to dim my lights either. Let them see how they like it. And Dr. King said to him, no, you need to dim your lights no matter what they do, because we need to have somebody able to see on the road, even if that person isn't us. And for me, it is a powerful story because it is that underlying idea that you do not pay hate with hate. Right, that we heard Dr. King always speaking about love being the way that would heal our world. But, you know, when you hear it in a speech, it's all very well. It sounds beautiful. But when you see somebody actually living it in their lives in a fairly small, mundane way, that is, how do we treat one another as we are driving along country roads in the middle of the night when no one is seeing us? There are no TV cameras on us. No one is probably going to write this story is to me the, the, the core of what it means to be a human being recognizing our connection with other human beings. That no matter who it is that you are interacting with, that if you start from a place of respecting their humanity, then the opportunities for healing, for wholeness, for building community are so much greater for us all. Um, I, I grew up in apartheid South Africa and, and at the time when I was growing up um, as a black girl, I was not even a second class citizen. I was a third or fourth class citizen um, as a, a, a black female. 
um, and 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 recognize that from seeing the ways in which the adult women in my life were treated. Um, for instance, I grew up knowing that my grandmother, my mother's mother, was thrown off the farm that she and my grandfather owned when my grandfather died because as a black woman, she was not allowed to own property. And therefore, the government simply took away her farm from her. And she then turned to working as a domestic worker in order to support her children. And um, in our culture, in our Kosa culture and most African cultures, we are taught that anyone older than you is worthy of respect simply for the fact that they have lived longer on the planet than you have. And so growing up, my cousins, my older sister and brother, I was taught that I never call them simply by their first name. Each of those, even though, for instance, my sister is only three years older than me, but in calling her, in addressing her, I was taught that I placed an honorific before her name, an honorific that simply actually means big sister Tandi. And so I grew up calling my cousins big sister, big brother. Anybody who was my parents' age was mama or tata. Anybody who was my grandparents' age was makulu or tatomkulu. So that always people older than us were people who were respected. And went one time with my parents to pick up my grandmother from the house where she was a domestic worker and heard the children in that household calling her by her first name and not with any respect. You know, Joanna, where are my shoes? Joanna, you can't leave until this and this has been done. And I sitting there listening to my grandmother being disrespected was getting angrier and angrier. And when she got into the car, I realized that I was angry with those people, those young people who were my age, who I recognized as disrespecting her. But I was also angry with her for how do you allow yourself to be disrespected in this way by people? And um, and so when she got in the car, I I I said that to her. I was like, I, my heart is sore. My heart is so broken to have seen you disrespected in this way. And I am angry. I am so angry with those children that they did not even think to to honor you as somebody older than them. But I am also hurt that you, one of the people who I respect and I look up to so much in my life, has allowed yourself to be disrespected in this way. And my grandmother said to me, my child, the, the value of who you are as a human being is by how you treat others and not how others treat you. And at that time, it didn't really assuage my anger. I felt like she was throwing me a line, right? But as I have grown older and have listened to leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr., such as Nelson Mandela, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and so many people that I have had the opportunity to meet, it has become exceedingly clear to me that those people who have changed the world are in fact the people who live that lesson that it is how we treat others that determines our humanity. It is how we interact with those who are less fortunate than we are, how we react to those whom we recognize as other, as different from us, how we, how we interact with those who we are taught 
by different ways that these are the people who are either our enemies or our competitors or people who the world does not respect. That how we interact with those people is the measure of our humanity, not theirs. And so I, I take from um, those experiences and those lessons the idea that in any, in any interaction that I have, in any conversations that I have, that I make myself take a step back in those conversations, in those interactions, and remind myself that I am dealing with another human being. And that might sound, again, that might sound trite, right? I mean, yeah, of course, everybody is another human being, but there is so much in our world that teaches us to start with labels, to start with what we call that other, that we start with, illegal immigrant, or we start with um, we, we start with homeless person, or we start with juvenile offender, or we start with black person, um, that if we stop those tapes in our head, even just for an instant, and start by saying, I am dealing with, I am talking to, I am listening to, I am thinking about another human being who is as human as I am, who also feels pain, who also loves somebody, who also dreams about a better life for him or herself, who also is happy when they are surrounded by family members celebrating a birthday or an anniversary or a graduation, who also feels sadness when someone whom they love is hurt or is cast aside, that if we start from that place, then our interactions, then our conversations, then the things we are willing to do and say are going to be different. So there is no huge message of what work you must do in order to be great people. In fact, the work that we are each called to is to take a step back, particularly when we are dealing with those whom the world teaches us are other than us. To stop those voices in our heads telling us that, oh, they're not like us, or they don't feel pain the same way we do, or they don't think in the same way we do. To stop those tapes, to stop what we think we know about the other and allow ourselves to start from a place of saying, this is another human being. Let me give her or him the opportunity to tell me his or her story themselves. And it sounds easy, but I'm asking you to just try it today in the lunchroom, in your classroom, with your brother or sister, because sometimes that's the hardest. The siblings who get on your nerves day in and day out to say when your younger brother is trying to tag along with you or when your older sister is telling you what you should do to stop and just say, I'm dealing with another human being. Let me try and hear his or her story. Thank you. Wow. 
<laughs> Reverend Tutu, thank you. First of all, let's please give Reverend Tutu a virtual round of applause. <laughs> outstanding, absolutely outstanding. And, and, and remember, uh, class, this was uh, presented to us uh, in the 7 a.m. hour on West Coast time, right? So three hours ago, I, I suppose that many of you were still waking up or just getting out of bed and trying to find something to eat and figure out what you're gonna wear and so on and so forth. This is the moment that she's in. This is her, this is our three hours ago. It's 7 a.m. where she is. Powerful, powerful, powerful presentation. Um, I just want to underscore a couple of points that I heard Reverend Tutu make as we contemplate and think about, and I, and I hope meditate on, um, meditate on the, the words of wisdom that, that she has shared with us. First of all, she started out by telling us that we can make a difference wherever we are. She also, if you recall, told us a story about um, Martin Luther King Jr. and his experiences while not on camera. He's done some magnificent things in the public eye, but there are some um, as important things that he's done uh, off set and off uh, the, the cameras. Uh, and so some might call that, uh, some define that as integrity, the things that you do when no one else is looking, right? And so she reminds us uh, that uh, a couple things about that experience. And, and we, as she gave us that imagery of, of two cars coming uh, uh, towards each other and each have their bright lights on and and, 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 and through the frustration, you know, someone wanting to uh, sort of force the other to turn their bright lights off. So that making the decision where they're gonna, they're, they're gonna keep their bright lights on as well. And the, the, the object lesson from that is not to repay hate with hate. That was another takeaway that I got from this wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, Reverend Tutu also reminded us to, that we need to start our relationships at a place of respecting humanity. And when we do that, that increases opportunities for all sorts of things, including healing and many other things as well, right? Reverend Tutu also gave us the imagery of experiences of her grandmother, and not just her grandmother, but helping us to understand that there are cultures that place a premium of respect on anyone who is older than you, and not necessarily someone who is old, as old as your parents. Right? Even just someone who may just be a couple of years older than you. But the idea is that anyone who is older than you is due a particular kind of respect. And she told us about her grandmother and how her grandmother in certain societies, her grandmother was marginalized and was disrespected awfully. But her and 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 sometime and and all that the, all of that disrespect that her grandmother endured without returning hate for the hate, but her grandmother revealed something very powerful. And that is the way that you treat others, or in other words, the value that we have is based on the way that we treat others, not the way that others treat us. Wonderful, wonderful takeaway. People who have changed the world, Reverend Tutu told us, are people who have lived in that way, who have lived that lesson out loud. And finally, she challenges us to be mindful of how we label the others in, in our worlds and in our experiences, right? We often dehumanize people by being quick to call them by a title first, homeless person, immigrant person, black person, so on and so forth. But she challenges us to dig deep, to find the humanity in everyone and start in that place. Because after all, we all feel joy. We all feel sadness. We all feel Fear. We all feel concern. And Reverend Tutu tells us to let's give the opportunity for others to tell their story from a human place. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for those words of wisdom this morning. Thank you for being here today. Together, I know that we can accomplish anything. And I'm so excited about your commitment as local students to making our community a better place for everyone. We encourage you to continue having conversations and learning with your teachers, learning with your families, learning with your peers. We can't wait to see what you will accomplish in the future because as I said before, you really are the next generation. So to all of our students, our teachers, everyone who is present this morning, thank you again and for now, so long.
Oh, wait, I thought we were having questions from the students. I thought we had a time for, sorry, I meant to say that at the beginning that when yeah. we are through, we would like to hear from the students. And um, I did say have that. any I, questions. <laughs> I, got, I got too eager. I, I'm sorry, here I am, <laughs> I'm, I'm pu pu pushing you out the door. And I, I even said that we were gonna do that. So before <laughs> we do sign off, there is an opportunity here to ask questions and, and, and we really do hope uh, that you will uh, feel brave enough to do so. So, Michael, how will we do this? Will we use the chat function or will, will we allow folks to unmute? How will we do this? Yeah, people can uh, speak up however each classroom wants to submit a question. Uh, if they want to do it on camera, which would be awesome, or in the chat room. Either way. Yeah. Again, my apologies for rushing us off, but don't be shy, guys. We, we have a, a unique opportunity, a special, special guest with us. Any questions about the words of wisdom and lessons learned from Martin Luther King Jr.? Anyone? Yes, we have, we have a, a couple of questions from Brown Summit Middle School. Hey, Brown Summit Middle School. All right, this is Harris. I'm Harris Abernathy from Brown Summit Middle School. And what is the what is your favorite part of the work you do? Oh, wow. The favorite part, I, you know, um, actually it is the talking, which is, which is quite interesting because growing up, I was constantly in trouble for talking. I was always getting punished. I went to boarding school and you were not supposed to talk after lights out. I, I went to um, an all girls school in England where you were not supposed to talk at the beginning of assembly when we were assembling and I was forever talking. Um, and so in both in the work that I, I do in speaking, public speaking, but also as a clergy person, I preach um, from the pulpit um, regularly. And I love doing this. I think part of the reason I love it is for me, that is one of the easiest ways for me to connect with other people. So all of that to say, if you are a talker, don't, don't worry when you get punished because that might be what you end up doing in your real life when you grow up. Thank you. Um, I personally have a question. This is uh, Beth Purdue from Brown Summit Middle School. Yes. I just, it's not a question. Well, a, a comment, first of all. I want you to know that I had the opportunity when I was uh, graduating from high school, our guest speaker for our graduation was your father, the Archbishop Desmond okay. Tutu. So that was just a wonderful experience for me. Uh, and it's just wonderful to see you carrying on doing work uh, that he was so involved in and still in that work. So, thank, you thank you so you. much. Thank you. Any other questions in Brown Summit? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm called, um, I'm here with Smith High School. And uh, I have a student, Anna, who has a question. She won't ask, ask it herself. So she oh, has come asked on, you Anna. To ask you. She wanted to know when you were going through school what your career goals were. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to know um, recently, you know, with things going on, do you have any current examples of discrimination? Okay. Yes, thank you, Anna. And I would have loved to see see you ask the question yourself, but I understand we don't all like standing in front of cameras. Um, so when I was growing up, actually, my my I, my first dream was to be an interpreter for the UN. And I loved learning languages. Um, I did Latin and French all my way through high school and started off in college majoring in, in languages, doing French and Spanish. Don't ask me to speak either of those languages now. It is terrible, terrible, terrible how badly I speak those languages now. Um, but that was, my, that was my first dream when I was in high school. And then um, when I finished college, 
I decided to do a master's in international economics, hoping to be a diplomat. Again, I then got to see what diplomats had to do and realized I do not have a diplomatic bone in my body and I would be an embarrassment to my country or whoever it is who asked me to be a diplomat. So, um, so I, I went into um, being an economist working on development um, projects in West Africa um, and then moved through any number of, of jobs and positions to finally accepting the call to the priesthood. So the, all of that to say, yeah, if, if you're not sure what you want to be, don't worry, it will come, it'll come. And even if you are sure what you want to be, what you end up being might not be what you think you want to be right now. <laughs> oh, and then the second part in terms of um, discrimination. I, I think that almost every person of color can give examples of discrimination that they experience almost on a daily basis um, in, 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 in their lives. Um, I, one of my continuing challenges um, is the, the propensity for in-store security to follow me as I am trying to shop. Um, the idea that, uh, and, and I don't wear coll my collar every day. Very often when I'm out in, you know, in my, in the department stores or the mall or wherever, I'm in sweats and a t-shirt and, um, and find myself profiled as a possible shoplifter. Uh, and know that that profiling is simply because of being uh, a black woman um, in particular in particular stores. So yeah, so that experience is one I continue to experience. Um, I have a question. Oh, look at it go. I'm. I'm Jake Evitt from Brown's Summit Middle, and uh, thank you, Reverend Tutu. My question is, what can we do in our communities to help promote your work for equality? Thank you. Is that a Bob Marley t-shirt you got on? Yes, it is. All right. Yes. OK. <laughs> You're kind of young to have a Bob Marley t-shirt on. I mean, that was my time. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I do think that that the work for human rights happens wherever you are and whoever you are in in terms of that for each of us, we we experience, I'm sure even even now you experience on a daily basis opportunities to either treat people with respect or to dehumanize. Um, I, I, I was doing a program at our church um, about um, economic empowerment uh, a, 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 a few months ago. And one of, our, one, of, one, of, one of our members talked about being in Washington, D.C. with his nephew and seeing somebody who was experiencing homelessness come up to them um, outside a subway, uh, uh, I mean, a, a metro, the un underground, whatever it's called in, in DC, um, asking him for some help. And he said, you know, my inclination was to simply walk past him. And my nephew turned to me and said, are you going to pretend you don't see and hear him? And that the, the parishioner said, that stopped me short, that my nephew was watching my interaction and my choice to ignore the person 
was a statement to my nephew about my perception of that human being. And he said, and that has changed how I deal with when I see somebody who is experiencing homelessness, no matter where it is. So that story for me is a powerful one in, in saying to us, each of us on an almost daily basis is given the opportunity to either treat people with respect or to ignore or dehumanize them. And for, for my belief about what human rights means in the world, what justice means in the world, it means how we, how we treat one another. It's not simply about the laws. It's not simply about our government. It's not simply about how, whether we give to charity. It is about recognizing the humanity of each person that we interact with. So for me, moving the work forward is how do you deal with your classmates? How do you deal with your teachers? How do you deal with students from your rival school? And that doesn't mean don't whoop their ass in basketball. Go ahead and do that. But be respectful when you deal with them in, in other interactions. Thank you. That was a great question. I think we saw a question from Andrew's African American history something. Yes, I, just, I just wanted to know how you lived like growing up as a child. How did I live? Yeah, growing up as a child. So um, I actually had a, a very strange um, growing up because uh, because my father was a priest, uh, we moved a lot as the, the family of a priest, but also because my father was given opportunities. Um, so I started school at, I started kindergarten in England, uh, where my father was studying at where my father was doing a master's in London. So I started off school in, um, in a, in a, in a country that, uh, was not racist in the way that South Africa was racist growing up and then went back to South Africa and was in the midst of apartheid, um, to the extent that my parents wanting me to continue my, my education, sent me to boarding school at six and a half because of the system of education for black South Africans was such an inferior system that they sent us to neighboring countries to go to go to school. So I started boarding school at six and a half, two days drive from where my parents were. So I spent nine months of every year away from my parents from the time I was six and a half until I was nine. Um, and then we moved to another country. So I spent, a, I spent much of my life experiencing apartheid, which was the system of government in South Africa that basically said black people were not fully human. Black people could never be equal to white people. And it was shown not only in, um, in the education system, it was in um, hospital, access to hospital, it was in housing, it was in even in the jobs that Black people could have. In South Africa, there was a Job Reservation Act which said some jobs only white people could qualify to do. And those jobs ranged from uh, being surgeons um, to being um, government officials to being long distance bus drivers. So, um, so grew up in a system that told me as a black child that there were things that I could never aspire to be even a long distance bus driver because simply because I was black. And at the same time, because of the opportunities that my father was given, I got the opportunity again to go 
to high school in England, to travel around Europe as, as a teenager, um, to, to experience a, a British education for the first couple of years of high school, um, and then to go back to South Africa. And so I've, I've lived a very, it could, it could be a confusing life in many ways that on any given day, year, I was either living in the throes of apartheid or I was living as a fairly privileged middle-class black family in, in Europe. Um, and, uh, and I think that having those experiences has been part of what has driven me to do this work in, in recognizing how arbitrary my experiences were, because there was nothing special about, there was nothing different about me when I was living under apartheid South Africa and when I was living as a middle-class black child in London, England. There was nothing different about this particular person. It was the system in which I lived. And so that to me has made me determined to work for systems that are about justice, that allow us, whoever we are, whatever we look like, whatever our background, to live to our fullest potential. Thank you. Thank you. It appears uh, I just want to make sure uh, we is there there's a question in the chat box. Is that right? OK. What are you, what are you, yeah, what are you seeing currently that encourages you regarding the positive future of equity? Um, and I'm seeing a number of things in, in, in different spheres. Um, so one is I am seeing particularly young people um, saying racism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, misogyny, all of those things take away from all of us, that they limit each of our experiences in the world, that when, um, when, when Black people are limited in their opportunities, that limits our society's opportunities of healing and wholeness. When LGBTQ um, people plus people are limited in their access and in their freedom, that limits access and freedom for all of us as a society when um when we when we when we uh build up anti immigrant um sentiment when we highlight islamophobia that we limit our access to different perspectives different stories to different ways of solving problems that that when we are not sitting at a table that listens to the stories and perspectives of all people, then we are limiting the ways in which we can solve the problems that face us all. So that, that gives me hope. The fact that um, particularly young people are saying, if we are going to be a, a vibrant, a thriving global community, it has to be one where the voices of all people are heard, where the gifts of all people are given an opportunity to, 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 to be valued. So that, that's one. Um, as a clergy person, I think that an, another thing that gives me hope for um, a positive future with regards to equity is the number of people who are questioning the, 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 the structures and inherited wisdom 
which is not off, which is often not wisdom of our institutional religions that um, that are questioning, you know, how what parts of sacred text are we using to justify our actions? And why are we choosing those particular parts of sacred texts? And what parts of sacred texts are we ignoring in, in, in making our decisions and our plans for how our world is supposed to look? And so having, um, uh, having voices that are, 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 are looking at theology from different perspectives, looking at scripture, struggling with our sacred texts, struggling with the ways in which um, faith communities have institutionalized um, discrimination, uh, that, that to me is encouraging to be hearing womanist takes on 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 theology muherista um perspectives on theology um liberation theology um black theology you know all of having all of these now ways of saying how do we deal with our faith how do we live our faith in the world? How do we decide what it is that is fundamental to our faith? That, that excites me and encourages me. Um, and and I, I guess, lastly, it is seeing uh, the response, a growing response, not just from young people, but from people around the world to the response to um, the the rise of authoritarianism in in our world that we have we have seen the rise of um, a, a political leadership that that thrives on division, and we're seeing that in Europe. We're seeing that. In Latin America, we've seen that in this country, we've seen it on the African continent, we're seeing it in, so we're seeing it all over the world. And we are seeing a reaction to that, that has, that is a grassroots reaction that is saying, this is not who we want to be in the 21st century. And this is not what is going to assure the survival and thrive and and thriving of us as a human race, but also of our planet and 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 the larger creation in which we live. So we have the the question that we'll ask now. If there are, we, we're getting close on top here. Uh, and these are these are really rich questions. I, my, my heart, it, this is really doing my heart good. I'm so glad that our students have uh, have really uh, stepped up to put some great questions on the table. So, are there any other questions from our schools before we wrap up? Anyone at all? I know you still got one more in you. Somebody. Any final questions? Anyone? All right. Oh, we might have a taker here. I saw somebody breeze by the camera. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Hi. Um, I see a lot of times um, young people my age. Um, in high school, in middle school, I see a lot of examples of people that think that, um, you know, discrimination is such a thing in the past 200, 300 years in the past. And um, I just found it interesting that you have like personal examples. Um, and, and, you know, you're not 200, 300 years old. So 
I, I just, I, I, I like the fact that you have those examples and you can bring that, you know, to young people. And so I, I guess my question is, um, how would you stay the state of Africa is now, you know, because I didn't know that, um, that there was that big of a divide in Africa. I'm just curious what kind of state it is politically, racially now in 2021. Thank you, thank you. And yeah, thank you also for saying that I'm not 200, 300 years old. Sometimes I feel that old. So, um, but yeah, uh, so, you know, and, and, and this is specifically about South Africa, which is, you know, the, the country right on the tip of the continent, which is where I'm from. Um, and, uh, and so in, in South Africa, we had, our very first uh, democratic elections in 1994. So that was the first time that I was legally allowed to vote in the country of my birth. It was the first time that my grandmother got to vote. And at that point she was 91. So she, she only voted once in her life uh, because she died after that first election. So that was, so we're talking about from 1994 um, to the present has been a transition from a system of apartheid to a democratically elected government. And so you, as you can, I'm sure you can imagine that, um, that that's less than 30 years. So we are still in the process of dealing with the impact of that generations long discrimination. And so we, we still have um, a, a, a huge gap, particularly economically. So while when you look at our parliament, you will see our parliament is, people call it a rainbow of nations, that it, it, it represents the, the range of um, ethnic groups in, in the country. But when you look at the economy that um, still most of the economic wealth of our country is still concentrated in the hands of, of, of white men. And so we are, in a process of, of trying to bring um, equity, not just politically, but economically in, into the society. And so the reality is that for the vast majority of, of Black South Africans, the experience, even though we everybody now has the right to vote and to be represented in parliament, that the reality is that still Black schools in rural and in townships are overcrowded, are less, um, have access to not, not as good facilities in terms of libraries, laboratories, even playing fields, um, that still hospitals in, in, in Black communities are still struggling in terms of, of, of access um, to medical care. Uh, and so it is, it, is, it is a process. It is still an ongoing process. And it will probably be a process that continues at least through my children's lives. Um, and and, and, and it, it is, uh, you know, and it is a process that often it seems like, the, you know, you take two steps forward and one step back. Um, and there, there is there is much that gives hope in in South Africa, and there is uh, there is much that makes you want to weep um, at the same time, which I guess is the reality about transitions. Thank you so much for that thoughtful response. Thanks to all of you for participating today and for your thoughtful questions. Again, please accept my apology for trying to adjourn us sooner than, uh, than we were supposed to. But now uh, uh, this was, I think we're ending on a perfect note. Uh, so together, again, we really can't accomplish anything. And I, and I am excited about uh, the commitment that you all have made as students and teachers and faculty to be part of our uh, meeting today, but also to make 
our community of Greater Greensboro a better place for everyone. And I do encourage you to continue having these conversations. Don't let this conversation die in this moment. Please continue to engage one another, your families, your peers, your teachers, and so on and so forth uh, to continue this rich discussion and this rich dialogue. I really can't wait to see what you as this next generation will accomplish. I thank you for being part of this meeting today. And for now, we're saying so long. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Bye.